The reason we come to church is not out of fear, I hope. The reason we come together as church is out of hope. We hope for something better. We hope for something good. We hope that the world that we inherited will be better off because we were here. That's the power of church. And that's the responsibility that we have at St. Michael. We have a decently large church, which means not only do we have the opportunity to come together and make a big impact in the world in a positive way, we have the responsibility to do so. If we do not do that, then we're not living up to the responsibility God has given us, to the opportunity God has given us. And so when we see things happening in front of us, and we'll throw back to Charlottesville, that's recent, or say Hurricane Harvey that devastated the southeast of Texas, we know we can do something more together than we can ever do on our own. We can actually look at the face of the bad, the face of hate, the face of those who would exclude anybody from God's love and say that is not okay. It is not good enough that we do something just in our in our quiet rooms or behind closed doors, that we have the opportunity to make known that what Jesus offers us, which is love for everyone, everyone. And we can live into that together here by making sure everyone knows that everybody is deserving of God's love, even those people who don't seem to show it to others, that God loves everybody enough, just as you are, but that God loves you enough not to leave you where you are. And so that gets us to perhaps the formation emphasis of what we hope to do this year and into the future, where we want to go. We want to go into the future as a church that is a light in the darkness, that is a banner that people see and know that they can find hope, they can find rest, they can find peace, they can find friendships, they can find God here. And that's something that we don't do just leadership. It's something we all do together. I think many of you have probably heard me say that toward the end of last school year, there were many Sundays in a row where someone would run up to me before a church service and say, I brought a friend with me to church. And they wanted to introduce me to their friend because that may have been the first time that they'd ever invited someone and brought someone to church with them. That's the kind of hopefulness that we can share. Not because, again, we're afraid of God or we want someone to come here because we're afraid what God might do to them. It's not that at all. It's because we find a ground of our being here, right? We experience the transcendence of God in a very unique and real way and we want to share it. We want other people to experience that same transcendence here to have friendships here, friendships that sustain us, those holy friendships that go beyond just the people you like to hang out with, but the people who push you and pull you and stretch you and form you, help form you into the disciples that God is calling us to be. Now, throughout the summer, if you were reading your archangel, which I hope you did, and if not, you can pick up old copies or read them online, we unpacked some of the work that vestry and clergy and staff have been doing in the spring of this year. Now, with your vestry's leadership, we identified three very high-level goals that we wanted to work toward both in 2017 and 18. And those three goals will be feed the spirit, find your plus one, and building the future. Those three high-level goals are what will guide us within the framework of how we invest ourselves together. We all have a lot of energy, a lot of capital, time, talent, treasure, and we're going to work toward investing all of that capital into these three high-level goals. We've identified that there's a lot we can do in the next five or ten years, but there's only so much we can do in one year. And so we've tried to, very intentionally and prayerfully, figure out what it is that we can do this next year together and then invest a lot in that so that we begin to build up this foundation. And there are lots of things we'd love to do, but perhaps we have to do a few things first and then we can do those other things next. And that way, as we build up, the foundation is extremely solid and strong. So 
I want to discuss each of those high-level goals in the general terms, knowing that next week we'll get into some of the specifics. The first, what we call imperatives, is feed the Spirit. In a lot of discussions, what we discovered is that the primary reason we come to church is to be fed. We want to be filled up, we want to be refreshed, we want to be fed. And so when we come to church, whether that's on a Sunday or it's during the week, we want to make sure that all of our experience of church is very filling and feeding. And that whatever we do as we come to church with one another leaves us just a little better off than when we came. Doesn't mean we're necessarily happier, that's not how that works. But perhaps we are fuller, we are made fuller by having experienced the love of God here in this place through one another. And so that happens in a few different ways, but primarily that happens through our relationships with one another. And so the second imperative, high level macro goal, is find your plus one. And so the plus one is this idea that you don't do anything on your own, right? When we experience the world around us, we can go on our own, but it's never the best idea, right? It's always better to have a buddy. It's always better to have a friend. It's always better to have someone with you that can help lift you up when you fall and help re-energize you when you get low. That plus one is a very important quality for us to surround ourselves with. And so what, I, what we will be challenging everyone here in the congregation to do this year is to find that plus one. Worship on Sunday is a great experience. It's sort of a festival, right? But the festival of worship is not an intimate relationship. The festival of worship that we have on Sunday, the event we experience together is a celebration of the work we have done that week, right? It's this respite, this little island moment because the world is busy, our lives are busy and they are stressful and they are very full of lots of stuff. And at least once a week on Sunday, we get to take a break and a pause and just revel in God's goodness. But that is not the plus one. We want that to be what we do just because it's what we do as church. We give thanks to God. We bless God. We celebrate and glorify God. And we have this extra. If you have something extra, plus one already, then good for you. If you are listening to this and thinking, I don't really know what that plus one is for me then I want you to begin to read through the materials that we are producing. Begin to talk with others here in the church. Seek out that plus one. It can look like many different things. Perhaps it's committee activities, you know, serving on the altar guild or other groups like that. Perhaps it's study, like a Bible study or a book group. Perhaps it's service, You're going out and delivering meals on wheels with some friends, or you're serving at North Dallas Shared Ministry, or teaching a child at Jubilee, one or the other, you need that extra thing. And it's not just a nice plus one, right? We all do lots of extra things. What I'm challenging us all to consider is that this extra plus one is something explicitly sacred, explicitly holy. Something where you create relationships that do not look like the other relationships in our lives. Where you've got a person that you can talk to, maybe a few persons that you can talk to, when things are really hard. We all know we have friends who love to celebrate, right? I don't know many friends who won't be happy to go get a drink or eat cake or, you know, light candles or something fun like that. Gosh, that sounded so boring. Um, (laughs) I realized that I might need to work on fun. Um, (laughs) We've all got friends we can have fun with. But I think if we're honest, many of those friends we have fun with are not necessarily the people that we want to be with when the mess happens, right? Now, we, many of us in this room, and perhaps because we are a self-selected group, it's a higher percentage of people in this room than in the normal population. Some of us in this room have those friends where it does not matter what has happened, what bad has happened, we know we can go to them. We are okay just exposing ourselves and being vulnerable completely. But my guess is that at least a good number of us in this room, and most certainly most people out there in the world, 
don't have those people in their lives where they can go to and expose all of the mess, right? I often put it this way. If you don't have people in your life who can come to your house and see you in your messy house at any time of the day, you don't have holy enough friends. It's that plus one kind of relationship that we need in our lives. Because someone said to me the other day, um, this was actually a couple months ago, um, I caught them in, during, out in the week, grocery store or something like that. And I said, I missed you on Sunday. Have you all been out of town? And they said, no, it was just too hard. We couldn't get it together to come to church. Whatever they meant by that, this is the place you should be able to come when you don't have it together. But if we're not careful, this becomes the place where you come to show that you've got it together, right? How many of you, you're laughing, I love that nervous laugh that takes like <laughs> two whole seconds to come to fruition because everyone's like, <laughs> We all know the rush in the house, right? Getting everything together and trying to get to the car and you've got to get here and you forgot something or your shoes are two different colors or, you know, you've got one earring or whatever, right? And you try to walk into church, no matter what has happened, right? We all walk into church like this. <sighs> you know, everything's good. We are so good. It's okay to be put together, right? It is, it is also absolutely critical that this be the place where you can come when you are not. That takes all of us changing the culture to make sure that people feel extremely welcome here, especially when things are falling apart. That this is the place where they can be, where they can climb up into God's lap and rest in that love, especially when things are not working out. That plus one makes us vulnerable. And there is power in vulnerability. There is transformation in vulnerability. One of my th the things that I do not like that lots of people say is God never gives you more than you can handle. That is A, not biblical. And B, I don't even think that's theologically sound. Because if anything, it is only when we can't handle it that we find out God can. That's the need. When we hit that bottom and God holds us, that's when we figure out what all of this is about. Now, there's a reason that it's easier for people in desperate circumstances to understand the gospel. Because unless you understand that you are desperate, unless you know you cannot do it on your own, all of Jesus sounds just like a nice guy full of platitudes. Jesus is not a nice guy, in case you've not had Bible study. Jesus is not nice, all right? Jesus is loving, not nice. Jesus often experiences people, and if we're, if we're really reading not just the pretty stuff that we often read in church, but if we really read the other stuff, there are moments where we think, Jesus, what? That's because Jesus is not concerned with nicety. Jesus is concerned with transformation, and if we are not vulnerable enough to be weak, if we are not vulnerable enough to be messy, then what Jesus is offering us really doesn't make any sense. It's just something to do on Sunday before lunch. It can be something so much more than that. But here's the catch. Me telling you that is nice. And there are many people here who are nodding or smiling. That's super. Thank you. But... Unless you've got a person or two who will actually journey life with you and remind you of that every step of the way, it doesn't really change you. That's what the plus one is about. It's about being willing to give yourself to someone else and to receive what they give you in return. It's the person who will look at you and say, I don't care that you were on vacation all week. It's Sunday, go to church. Or I don't care that you just didn't get a lot of sleep last night. Get up and go to Bible study. Say your prayers. It's the person who knows what is most important and the person you're willing to listen to 
tell you what is most important. I want that for everyone. And if we in this room find that, then the people in our spheres, in our lives out there, will see a change in us. And they will want so badly to know what's happened. And then we get to tell them. We get to tell them that God's done something in our lives and that they can have that too. Why don't you come to church with me on Sunday? I was listening to a story a friend told me earlier this week about their child going on a mission trip and coming back. And on this mission trip, their child standing up and talking about Jesus. They'd never heard them say anything about it before. Never heard them talk about their faith. Never heard, brace yourself, a testimonial. Ooh, Episcopalians, I saw you shiver. (laughs) And yet here their, you know, middle elementary school student was talking about how much God loves them. And they realized they had never in their life gotten up and told anybody that themselves. And here their child is doing it. I want us to be comfortable talking like that, talking about faith, talking about the changes that we have made, because that's what is attractive to those out in the world. You've heard me talk before about the changing demographic of life in this country. We all know that it's happening. We all know in this room, no matter what our age is, fewer people are connected to churches now than in the past. Whether your past is 10 years or 40 years, you know that it's been a decline in connectedness, right? That is a real thing. It's not St. Michael. It's not any other church you know. It's a cultural shift. But the only reason that culture has shifted is because we, the church, have let it shift. That's the holy friend right there. It's on us. Nothing is happening to us. We are not victims. I'm looking around this room and I see, I really see no victims. I know many of you, and you are like the opposite of victims. You are intimidating and strong and scary, most of you. (laughs) No victims here. We can actually change this. And I don't mean to to make it out to be something that is uh, unrealizable. That's a good word. I don't mean it to be something that we cannot manifest. We can do this. The people in this room can do this. And I think that is our responsibility, which brings me to the third of our high-level imperatives. We call it build the future. Build, though, has many connotations top level of that is we want to build the kind of culture we wish existed. I think there's a gift in the changing demographic of the country. I think that if we're really to look and unpack all of the demographic shift, what's really happening is that people are walking away from the institutional junk around church. People are really walking away from religion, not God. Religion and not spirituality. Somehow, we, the church, not just St. Michael, but the big, broad, capital C church, have let our stuff, our systems, our polity, get in the way. The wall that we have built around what is here and not here has become so dense and so high to get over that people out there have said, you know what, I'm okay. Because the message that has been heard loud and clear is that God is much bigger than any one person, any one church, any one idea. God's always bigger than anything we can create. And they've heard that loud and clear and they know. Well, they can go ride bikes in the woods and experience God. They can go fishing and experience God. They can go on a walk with their friend in the neighborhood and experience God. That's all true. God is everywhere. The problem is, though, what we've already talked about. When bad things happen, and they do, and they will, when life gets hard, the walk out in the woods is not the best way to sustain 
that sense of God in our lives, that ground and anchor of the sacred. It's when we have the relationships with one another. And so building the future means that we catch the vision of what faith can be, which is not a lot of the system stuff. It's not the buildings and it's not the processes. What it is is something a whole lot simpler and more profound. When we catch that vision, that God is just giving it this away, right? It's just giving this away. Then we can actually go and spread this good news, the real good news, to all those in the world who are spiritual but not religious. We've got to change what it means to be religious people. Not let the religion get in the way of the spirituality. Not let religion get in the way of God. Now that can sound a little scary because if you're in this room, you are probably a churchy person, right? Because it's not quite Labor Day yet, so you came to church, which I have found in Dallas is, I mean, that's a big deal. And there are donuts and cake down the hallway, yet you're sitting here, which means you do want to hear something good. What is good here is not me. What is good here is Jesus. We hear what Jesus has to say, but then we walk out these doors and think that whatever we've done here stays contained here. No, it does not. You can carry this in every part of your life. Carry this to the store, to work, to school, wherever you go. You can carry this and you're not going to be a crazy person. And I say that because we all know crazy people who do stuff like that. Well, then maybe you should be crazy too. Maybe we should put on the crazy about Jesus kind of identity. And if we do that, then people will know that we're not just frozen chosen here, that we are the experience of God on earth, the body of Christ, the best representation of God's hope for humanity. When we change the way that we do and share and live our life together here at St. Michael, we're going to have the capacity to give away these ideas to others. Some of you have heard me talk about St. Michael as a laboratory. And the laboratory of St. Michael is a gift well beyond ourselves. We will play with stuff. We will do things, and many of those things won't work. That's okay. I tell my staff almost weekly that the only thing I don't want them to do is make small mistakes. I want them to go down in flames. <laughs> do something big. And if you're going to make a mistake, make it worth it and then learn from it. I saw a poster in a school years ago that said, fail, then fail better. And I thought, if that's not really the human condition, perhaps the great hopefulness, nothing is ever going to be exactly how we want it to be, but it can be better every time we do it. And so what we do here at St. Michael is going to look like that. Changes here and there, additions and subtractions, and we're going to throw stuff against the wall and see what sticks. Because we have the capacity to do it. We have the fidelity to hold together. We have the vision to make changes so that when something works, we can give it away to all those groups in our world that might not have that kind of capacity. And in doing so, we don't just grow our church, but we help grow the church. Some of you know that I finished my doctoral studies last spring, and the essence of what the research I did was that Anglican spirituality, Episcopal spirituality, should be the most attractive expression of Christianity, period to all those who are coming behind us, to those younger than me, coming up and trying to figure out where God is in the world. That Episcopal identity should be the most attractive expression of Christianity. And so the challenge is to not put up the hurdles to connect to that Episcopal spirituality, 
to create access points that are many and numerous and varied so people can experience that kind of Episcopal spirituality. Because I think that those spiritual but not religious people who are of all ages would love this kind of way of being. So, thinking largely, as we look forward, we're going to be offering ways to experience that spirituality well beyond the classic ways of being. We're going to try stuff, see if it works. And so I ask that you just plug in, try it yourself. When I say we're going to try stuff, it can't be clergy or staff. It's got to be us. And so I invite you as you go into this new school year to, with an open mind and an open heart, see how you can do something different. And you may have been doing stuff for the same way for decades. So, try something new. Try something different. Plug yourself in and then let us know what you think about it. Not after one time, but after weeks of it, right? We all know how to create habits. Now we're being invited to create new habits. Try something that's going to help expand the way that you live, support you in those dark times, and help you share the good news beyond yourself or your family. Next week, we're going to look at how this stuff hits the ground. So what we've talked about with Vestry and staff is that we're looking at a very high-level idea, but we're going to connect it to the ground through committees and groups, staff members, and lay leaders. And so we're going to talk about how that works specifically next week. So it is not the same talk for two weeks. It's part one and part two. I had someone say to me, so you're doing the same thing two weeks? And I thought, are you trying to get out of one of them? <laughs> so can't get out of one of them. So next week, we're going to look at some of the specifics. And some of you know about certain things that we're tweaking. Um, but I'd love for you to know about more, kind of where we're going in our direction. And so you know I like questions. We've got about five minutes because I've been told we really do need to turn the space over. And so I'd love to invite any particular questions you all may have and see if we can clear up whatever confusing things I've said. David. Oh, yes. Thank you, David. So our videographer is recording this forum, and we will also record next week's forums. And when we do forums, one of the reasons that we are doing them in here is logistically there isn't another space where we all fit, but also there's a, a benefit to having a video because then if you're not here for any reason, you can watch it. Speaking of video, one of the things that you will notice in the next... Mm, I'll say month to give us a little wiggle room, is that we will have video cameras that will be live streaming this service in new ways. You're going to notice a few in this space. I hope you don't really notice them. The point is that they're not that obvious, but you will likely, those of you who will pay very close attention, will see that we'll have multiple cameras here, and that's in order to create the best streaming experience of worship that we can. Right now, we have anywhere between four and 500 people a weekend watching our services live online. And that's between the 9 a.m. here and the 11 a.m. in the parish hall. And so that's a great start, but that's also sort of a put a camera on a tripod and turn it on kind of thing. What we really want is for that experience to feel a bit more seamless and to also allow us to do things like we're going to have a camera up here that points to the choir loft. So when we have music moments in worship, right, particularly our anthem moments, people watching who are outside this room see the people making the music. So we'll be able to do some of that. And if we have live concerts, we'll be able to broadcast those. With the eye toward, I want St. Michael to be the Episcopal service that Episcopalians anywhere watch when they're not at their home church. So St. Michaelites 
great. When you're at the beach or the lake or some other fun place, then you can watch us. I had someone, I don't know if I said this to you last May, um, one of our very regular members who had just made a, a long, you know, years and years history of going with their family away from Dallas for Easter Sunday, said for the first time, they rolled their TV out on their deck and there were like 30 people around the deck watching our Easter service on a big TV live. And she said at one point she teared up because she said, I, I hadn't seen this in so long because of this family moment that they do at Easter. And she said, I felt like I could be there even though I wasn't there. So on the one hand, this is not an excuse for you to go to the lake house and watch us on TV. Okay. But when you are not here, you can experience our worship. And for those people who are Episcopalians all over the country or the world, when they're traveling, it is most likely, because there are only a couple churches that do this, period, that their church does not stream their services. I want for St. Michael to be the place that meets their need. And so wherever they are, they can watch what's happening here. And so that's a long answer to, yes, we're recording this forum and we'll record the forum next week. So maybe one more? Yes. Will you be turned in for reading your program rather than listening to the sermon? You might be struck down, but it's not. <laughs> I won't do it. Um, no. No, sermons will be, and so another thing um, that has nothing, sorry, has nothing to do with your question, but sermons. I don't believe that a sermon series has been done in the nave, in the main 9 11 o'clock services ever. Is that right? Or at least in the memory of people who have said that to me. And so that's something new that we're starting, right? I found in the past that when you connect Sundays intentionally, so no Sunday is standalone. As Episcopalians, it's easy for us to feel like a Sunday is a standalone moment, right? We come to church on Sunday, and if we don't come the next Sunday, then we come the Sunday after that, and no big, right? You just, you just sit down and you get it, right? What I really want is for everyone, I'm trying to say this without it sounding manipulative. Um, <laughs> whatever, it's manipulative. What I really want is for you to know you missed something when you were not here, right? To know that, say, if you miss week three of the sermon series, when you show up to week four, you missed it. So you need to see it, right? And you'll be able to see it because we record it. Now, you should come to church. Bob Johnson has this great line where he says, if, if you're in town, you're at church, period, right? I'll save you the trouble of making a decision, right? If you're here, come to church. But if you're not here, because, you know, we, we're not always in the same place all the time, then we'll package that up for you to see it. But hopefully what will happen is that you'll, un you'll experience church in an arc, not just a standalone Sunday. And you'll know that, so in September and October, we have a series and you won't want to miss it. And I found in the past when I've done these that one member of a married couple will come to church when maybe they wouldn't have when the other one was gone because they don't want to miss that series. And so hopefully we'll connect the experience so that church is not just momentary but you really do see an arc and that you're not trying to be changed and transformed this week. You're trying to be changed and transformed this fall, this year, this decade, right? You see a long arc that changes us over time and that that's a good thing. Now I've seen people for the 11 o'clock service poke their heads in the back. And so let's end and continue next week. And I thank you so much for your time and I'll see you soon.